<laughs> All right, guys, welcome to the Odd Couple Costa Rica podcast. I'm Michael Allen, travel Costa Rica now.com. Who and Allen from where are you from? Living in Costa Rica. Cheers, man. Hey, I missed you last week. Uh, we missed all you guys last week, and sorry we had to do that, but I promise you the odd couple is going to be more consistent in their podcasting. We were just both out of the country for a couple weeks, but uh, we're back, ready to go. And, you know, since we are doing this every week and we want to get to know our audience, we want you to know about us, we thought it might be a good idea if we kind of introduce ourselves and maybe tell you just a little bit about our lives and who you're watching and, you know, I don't know, just a little bit of backstory. Today, we're going to be talking about Alan's story. And then next week, well, we probably need about four podcasts to do mine. But uh, next week will be me. And so we just thought it might be interesting if you guys got to know us a little better. Maybe some of you guys are going, we don't want to know you any better. Stick to Costa Rica. Well, we don't care. We're going to tell you about ourselves anyway. So That's like it. Right. <laughs> like it. Oh, first off, before we start, Alan, on your story, what do you think? We're not going to get into this because it's a whole nother podcast. But briefly, what do you think about that whole 180 stamp thing? Well, you know, the biggest thing is it's about time, Costa Rica. So I'm hoping it's going to be a good thing, but time will tell. Yeah, it's hard to say where that's going because obviously you can give 180, but do you get it twice? Do you get it again? What do they do at the next time? That's going to be the more interesting thing. That's 180, right. 180, 180, 180. Now I'm a believer. I'll be a believer. And if it's consistent, I'll be a believer. But I've been living here long enough. I've been living here long enough. This is a vamos a ver. This is a we'll see about this where it's going to go. Right. We'll probably talk to you know, I will be a, just like you said, I will be a believer when it happens. As most people know, I was in. Uh, the United States, we came back, didn't get the 180. I got a theory as to why we didn't, but that sucked because I was expecting the 180. Well, I wouldn't have, just to be clear and for the audience, I wouldn't have given you 180 either. I'm just, you know, so we're clear. You, you know, know, I would, look, I would look at you. I would have given you 30. I would have given, I would have given Rebecca, your wife, 180, given you 30 so she can be away from you for a little bit. With friends That's like Michael Allen, who needs enemies? <laughs> Chew that. All right, man. Let's do let's do the Allen story. Let's just do the Allen story. I don't know when when we first. I, I don't know why I relate this to you, but I do. When we first talked about, let's say maybe introduce ourselves, have a little. I I, I can't that Steve Martin uh, movie a long time ago. I just picture you saying, "I was born a poor black child." I was. I was. Like, no. Well, because from where you're from, I don't know why I, I associate that with you, but I do. I was. Uh, and, well, yeah, and it's kind of funny because, you know, I, I was born very, very poor in South Louisiana and in South Louisiana where racism was still a very big thing, where uh, we had a one horse theater, OK, played the same show uh, on on. Friday and Saturday in the summertime, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. But all the black people, uh, they didn't have to, but it was like a buck fifty to, to stay in the balcony and two dollars if you wanted to be at the bottom. So all the white people paid two dollars and all the black people paid one fifty. It was a very, very uh, racial community uh, for those people that were racial. Uh, I wasn't. I had some very good black friends, you know. Uh, but anyway. So, well, yeah, well, hey, start from the beginning, man. You got some, you got brothers and sisters, a little bit about your parents, uh, you know, that kind of thing. Okay. Take well, us you know, back, well, Alan. Take us back to a little young, vibrant way back, Alan. Way back. All right. Well, okay. Well, I'm not, I wasn't planning on going that far back, but hey. Uh, you know, I was born in 1965, but my father, well, I, I don't even call him my father, my biological father uh, was a Marine. Okay. And so we were, I was actually born in Oceanside, California. I uh, got two other little brothers, uh, but he was, uh, if you go into the dictionary and you look up deadbeat father, well, his picture is right there. Okay. <laughs> so, I mean, I saw him. Kind of, I saw him. You did? You saw him? Yeah. yeah, I mean, yeah. So that, this dude left us when we were, you know, under five years old. So uh, anyway, 
so we grew up very, very poor. He never took, never seen him, never took care of him. You know, years down the road, we you know, kind of met. But anyway, long story short, my mom remarried. And when she remarried, she married a deaf guy. But what you don't know is that my mom is deaf. So because my mom is deaf and my dad is deaf, well, then... Um, my dad was very hard working. I mean, he he worked in a printing press, but then he ended up losing his job. So we ended up growing up the majority of our life on food stamps and welfare. And we, we never got new clothes unless my aunt bought us a new pair of pants for my birthday or something like that. And I'm like, I don't want no clothes for my birthday. I want some toys. <laughs> so, anyway, when my mom remarried, he had... Uh, two kids. So uh, he had his own, a little boy and a little girl. And so we ended up as a family of five, you know? And so it was very weird for us because way back then, there were no such thing as blended families. Nobody even knew what stepbrother and stepsisters were. Right. Uh, and so um, it was just a very strange, I, I had a very dysfunctional family, but we were very poor, but Hey, um, uh, I was always a go-getter. And by the time I was 12, I was working full time in a grocery store. I'd get out of school at three o'clock, change my clothes, 3.30. I was at the store. I was working. The store closed at 10. I'd come home, take a bath, go to sleep, go to school at eight, start all over and did the same thing. But I was helping my parents, you know, pay the bills. Would, would, so, you, have uh, been, would you have been the same if you weren't poor, you think? Was it your personality be a go-getter or do you think the poor pushed you out or do you just think you would have been like that regardless if you were rich or poor or, or? To, to be honest i believe i'd have been the same because i did not realize how poor we were until after i had moved out of my house and uh for whatever reason we kind of had this little family reunion and it was my sisters and stuff and it was really my my sister that brought up how poor we were and i was like you know, I didn't know, but we were poor. I mean, we were we were so poor that, I, I, you know, I remember times in my childhood going over to my best friend's house and spend the night and, and we'd go spend the night. And of course, you know, they're getting ready for supper and um, and they're like, OK, go fix your plate. And I'm like, go fix my plate. I had no idea how to fix my plate because my mama fixed all of our plates, because if she didn't fix our plate, somebody was going without food. And yeah. uh, so I didn't know yeah. how to fix my own plate. It was really strange for me to go fix my plate. But mama would fix all the kids' plates, fix daddy's plate, fix her plate, and there was no more food, you know? I'm going to ask you a question that everybody probably wants to ask you, and maybe only a couple have. Your speech pattern, your cadence, your inflection, you have a very, very distinct way of talking. You, I mean, you know that, right? Well, I have been told that. <laughs> And I was wondering, no, I'm wondering, is is that, do you think it had anything to do with your parents being deaf and the way you uh, inflect or the way you pronounce your words are very distinct? Your cadence is a little different than what I guess people would say the norm. Did you learn to talk? I mean, you know, where, is that just you talking and you've well, just always well, been like that or, you know? You know, I, I, I think. I think that could have come from. So now that you've heard a little bit about me being a kid, well, when I was 19, I got married. OK. And uh, so let me back up just a little bit. Uh, I ended up, uh, you know, I grew up as Catholic. My, my parents were Catholic and we were forced to go to school. And I was an altar boy for several years because my best friend was an altar boy. And so anyway, uh, but but I graduated reconnected with my biological father. The only rules is that I had to go to church and he used to be Catholic, but he wasn't Catholic anymore. He'd married this young girl and they were Baptists. And so the rule was to go to. So anyway, long story short, I ended up going to church. I got, you know, crazy saved and all that good stuff. And um, that only lasted uh, about a year there. And I came and, and anyway, I started going to Baptist church, never really went to a Catholic church much. My mama got so mad at me. She didn't talk to me for three months. How dare uh -oh. you go to another church? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, I wanted I, I wanted my mama to kind of get to know this whole new religion. So I took her to a camp and uh, it was a deaf camp uh, about an hour away. They were having this huge deaf camp. It was Assemblies of God deaf camp where they where deaf people from all over Louisiana would congregate right there. And they had this pastor that could do sign language and he would. Uh, and so anyway, I wanted to bring my mama there and. I was busy working. Anyway, she asked me if I brought her. I'm like, hey, perfect. I brought her. Long story short, I met this beautiful, unbelievably uh, good looking thing uh, up at the altar. And so instead of doing what I was supposed to be doing in church, I was like, check out the girls. Woo! 
Anyway, anyway, so I got married and met this girl who was deaf. But back to that speech thing, her parents, she was the baby of their family, and, and her parents really didn't want her learning sign language. So she went through speech therapy her whole life and learned to talk because deaf people can talk. They do have a voice. They just can't hear. Reading so, lips and stuff, right? So reading lips and yeah, she was she read lips. So back to that question, I think because she read lips, I was always, I've always been told I enunciate my words uh, very well. So I would enunciate and I would uh, make sure that she could understand what I was saying. If she didn't understand, I would use a different word, a different sentence, so that she would under understand. And she was very good in reading lips. So. I think that might be why my inflection, uh, my speaking, uh, but also uh, in my last year of high school, I took speech because I sucked at school, man. I barely got out and we were required to have four Englishes. Well, I didn't like English, but I was told I could take speech in place of the last English. I'm like, okay, cool. I took speech and um, Man, I, I was scared, but once I did that first one and, and got in front of the whole class, man, I was like a clown. I just had a great time talking in front of people. And whether did that help? I don't know. I'm thinking we're not talking that you married Rebecca back then. I think this sounds like a other person. Well, considering Rebecca ain't deaf. <laughs> I was just doing the math. I was just connecting dots. I just figured. Yeah, yeah so, you know, that's, a, you know, hey. We were married for 17 years, and uh, I joined the Marine Corps, and she went with me into the Marine Corps and uh, uh, had our first child when we were living in North Carolina for three years, then went uh, to Japan, lived there for three years, had our second child, and um, and I and I had a, had a very great career and really planned on staying in the Marine Corps uh, for 20 years, but my first love, which was grocery stores, because I started managing grocery stores when I was 18 and I was managing two grocery stores. So anyway, I uh, the store that I had wanted to buy just before I joined the Marine Corps uh, came up for sale. Well, it came up for sale and I was like I had about six months to get out. I was thinking about I wanted it so bad. I was like, man, I'm thinking about going AWOL, man. I, anyway, uh, I got out bought that store and uh, opened up that store and did really, really well in that store. Did great. I mean, it just best job I ever had, but it was a lot of work. And I pretty much got this ultimatum one day. It was either uh, keep the store or keep your family. Which one do you want? And um, well, I wanted my family. So I ended up going bankrupt, closed the store. And uh, we moved into this little bitty shack of a house on the lake that I had. It was kind of a, you know, summer camp type thing that I bought. And we were very broke. A year later, she <laughs> went on vacation with this Mexican and left anyway. <laughs> wow, we're not we're not going to dig too deep into that part of the story. I don't think. No. I don't think so. so hey, it wasn't funny back then. Okay. Matter of fact, I was pretty pissed. But anyway, uh, I just think anyway. it's funny how you said it. She she met some Mexican. Them damn Mexicans. You know how they are. <laughs> well, always breaking she, always breaking up marriages and stuff. That's right. Well, and it just so happened this was a. I mean, we were very. I mean, we were we were wealthy when I had the store, and so we went from being wealthy to slap broke. And so I had a job, she had a job, and and she met this guy where she worked at. And I noticed some things were kind of being different. And she went on vacation one time, never came back, you know. And um, and that ended that seventeen years. So <laughs> that's crazy, man. Never came back. Good lord. Ended up even it finished up, you know, her vacation and moved in with that guy. You know, anyway, crazy thing. So, uh, well, you met Rebecca at some points. So, well, that was a and that, and that's quite interesting because you know, for you you have to understand that I met her in church, um, and so we a year later got married, was going to church all the time. And it seemed like every single church I went to, and we were going to this Baptist church, every one of them wanted to start a deaf ministry, start a deaf ministry, because I'd go to church and I would sign the whole sermon for her so that she can understand church. And uh, anyway, so we were very, very active in church. And so whenever she left and didn't come back, I, I got pissed off. I was like, God, that ain't right. 
I've been going to church thinking 17 years, teaching Sunday school, doing deaf ministries, and now she left. You ain't real. <laughs> and oh. I got pissed off. How long did that last? That lasted about two years. Uh because I got mad. I, I didn't want to have nothing to do with God, didn't want to have nothing to do with church. I kind of went wild. Um, but you know what's strange is that uh and some people probably would not understand this and think I'm crazy, and that's okay. Uh, I can only be me. But uh, God kept talking to me. He kept encouraging me. He kept whispering to me. And, uh, well, one day, you know, I love to run, and I've always run for years since I was a kid. And and I happen to be living in a place where I could run these amazing trails in the back of the forest. And so I'm running these trails, man. I'm having a good time. And uh, I stopped, and it was this beautiful place. And I'm like, God, I what? in the world do you want man i just had enough you just constantly you know what do you want what do you want and i'm been telling you it was as if you would have been there saying you know speaking to me it was that loud and clear if you'd have been there in the woods you'd have thought that dude's nuts he'd been smoking some wacky weed you know uh, but i heard god say i want you to preach the word and i'm like man it ain't no way I, i'm just not good enough i mean i'm i'm divorced i'm just i'm literally going crazy i don't you know and uh, he says, and you think Paul was? And of course, I knew he was talking about Paul, uh, who, who his well, it was Saul who changed to Paul, wrote two thirds of the New Testament. And uh, and at that moment, I, I fell to my knees, cried, and I said, "Okay, God, if you if you if you will help me, I'll go." And so, uh, long story short, I went back to this little tiny Baptist church that I was going to. Told the pastor that, "Hey, I believe God wants me to preach." And his wife was sitting next to him, and she laughs. And I says, "Well, what what's so funny?" She's like. You ain't going to be no Baptist preacher because you're divorced. And I'm like, golly. Oh, <laughs> she wow. disqualified me like that. <laughs> you know, and I, and I got to thinking, you must not read the New Testament because Paul killed tons of people. And, and uh, you know, anyway, anyway, I ran back to the woods like a dog with my tail tucked between my legs. And I says, God, I thought you wanted me to preach. And God said, I didn't tell you I wanted you to be a Baptist preacher. I wanted you to preach the word. So long story short. I started looking for a non-denominational church. And, and so now when people ask me, well, I'm a Bible believing Christian. If it's in the Bible, I believe it. You know, so you were so you you were a preach, you preached. How long did you yeah. preach? Well, I ended up I ended up uh, finding a non-denominational church. Uh, and uh, after being there a little while for, you know, a few weeks, I went to that pastor, told him my story. And I asked him if he would mentor me. And he was all up for mentoring me. And so he mentored me and I served and I worked and I labored for several years. Then I was ordained and I continued to, to serve and preach in that church about three years until we ended up moving to Las Vegas and uh, did just, of course, I didn't make any money in ministry. That was all everything that I, I did just to serve. And, and while I was, you know, preaching, I still had to support myself and I had a, I had a other job, you know, but I did that for a little over, over three years. And then, um, uh, uh you know, and, and, and really that's been just, you know, that's me. That's, that was really has been my first love and always has been ever since then. You ever plan on going back to that world of, of actually preaching? Uh, yes and no. Um, uh, in reality, while I was preaching, I, I felt like God had showed me and I, I really, I, and it may, maybe it wasn't God. Maybe I wanted to start a ministry that would help a lot of people who have been hurt by religion. I saw my mom get hurt by religion because she was Catholic. She was divorced. Catholic church, pretty much, she felt like she was no good. Uh, same thing for me. You know, uh, all these religions have their rules. You can't do this, can't do that, blah, blah, blah. And I couldn't find those things in the Bible. Well, anyway, uh, I, I wanted to, to start this place, where uh, this ministry, where people who are mad at religion, hurt by religion, but they still believe in God, well, I wanted to start that ministry, and I still do want to start that ministry. Uh, have a small church where people who felt like God was calling them to preach, but they need someone that can mentor them, someone that can help them to preach what the Bible says in uh, in love, and not in "you're a sinner and you're gonna burn and go to hell." You know, so that fire and brimstone stuff, that that whole judgy stuff that people know about Southern Baptist churches, <laughs> right? Right. Because I mean, I got I got judged and, you know, I'm a believer in, uh, hey, I don't care if you go to church or not. I, I really do inside, but I respect people and I respect their choices. You know, hey, 
I mean, if you want to pray to the doorknob, pray to the doorknob. I don't care. Uh, you know, uh, if you want to know about my life, I'll certainly tell you. Hey, I definitely want to learn about you. And and if it helps me, then great. But I'm I'm a I'm a believer in that. Hey, uh, it's your life. And you should do whatever you want with it so long as it doesn't affect other people. So in other words, it's your life. Oh, I want to be a murderer. Well, now you're affecting my life from other people's lives. So as long as your life and your choices don't affect other people, I think you should be able to do whatever you want. So wait, so when you get out to Vegas, obviously you had to start making money at some point. So and I obviously know a little bit about your backstory. But so how did you start making money when you when you kind of left, let's say, the actual preaching world and kind of into more I need to. I get need to get a uh, job. I actually, um, I, I had, uh, I was, I was, I had begun working for this uh, education system where, where I could, I was wasn't quite working online, but it seemed like I was working for myself. Where I went to all of the reserves, National Guard, and I was uh, uh, speaking to them. So I was pretty much a motivational speaker telling them how they can get to where they want in life through education. The government gives you all of this money for education. We provide all of the tools. We provide a laptop, uh, you know, with all of the education. And, and so I was doing that while I was preaching. And then I preached this one sermon that was called uh, how God has created us for success. And then God said, Hey, I want you to write a book on it. I'm like, cool, I could do that. And he said, but I want you to put it online. And I'm like, dude, I, I barely can do email. And back then the internet was still a new thing. So, yeah. hey, I started writing and researching and hey, that book did go up on Amazon. You can still find it on Amazon today. Created for Success uh, by Bert Richard, which is my first name. But anyway, uh, anyhow, I thought, you know, I was going to get rich or something. Well, I didn't get rich from it. But what I did was I learned some massive skills that enabled me to be able to go to Costa Rica because I learned how to start making money online by learning all these things that I needed in order to actually get this book online, publish it online, all of that stuff. So it was, it was, it was through that endeavor that I learned how to work online. And now uh, that's what I do. I create courses. I teach people how to use different tools online in order to enhance their business, to market their business. I'm getting ready to to do another course on how you can, you know, I've did a course on how you can make money on Amazon about to do a course on how to make money on Esty and I'll promote that course, sell that course. So anyway, now I'm, you know, all of our money is made by working online. And, uh, and of course, Rebecca, she, she's online, but she, she, she's an accountant. So, you know, she does all her work from home. So our money is made by working online. Yeah. And this podcast, we obviously rake in a lot of money with this podcast. So that's another <laughs> stream of revenue yeah. i think you know it would be nice to say yes we make tons of money off youtube but youtube does not pay if you want to start a youtube channel you better do it because you mm. love youtube or love making videos Good luck. i'm telling you uh YouTube well what's gonna ha- i mean real quick what's gonna happen on youtube is what's happening to everything youtube will be taken over by really big businesses that have 50 people making videos for you helping you behind the scenes promoting your stuff it'll be like almost like a walmart big big all us little people will be crushed by i think a bigger uh entity of of videos that we won't be able to compete with i I, think i I agree that's that's exactly what happened to amazon when i first started in the amazon business uh it was a bunch of little bitty guys that that um we we built Amazon, okay, and it was all these third party sellers. Within well, Amazon became right. so massive that now they're kicking out all of the third party sellers. And in, in a couple of years ago, I had five different Amazon stores. They closed all my Amazon stores, and uh, man, that hurt me. That hurt me big time. But anyway, yeah. so um, but that's because yeah. I had all my one basket. Well, you got to diversify, and so in this next course. I'll teach people how to diversify all of that and uh, not go broke whenever stupid things like that happen. I think the exact same thing that you just said is going to be what ha- what happens with YouTube and people, you know, it's just going to be overtaken by just bigger organizations, you know, I yeah. think. Or whatever. Uh, so how did you get out? So you're in Vegas for a while. Uh, obviously, Costa Rica came on your radar at some point in some way. Uh, let's get you out here. 
So, hey, you know, we were living in Las Vegas, had only been there a year, had a, uh, we had rented this really nice apartment on the third floor, all full of brand new furniture. And hey, we, we always try to eat healthy. Well, one day we go to this farmer's market. Uh, my wife uh, goes in there. We're looking for some organic eggs and stuff. And she meets this uh, girl, uh, young girl. Well, I guess about our age who had just dreamed of going to Costa Rica, dreamed about it, just talked about it. She had done all the research. And hey, next thing I know, two hours later, I'm bored out my mind. I can't count enough eggs. And Rebecca and this girl are still talking about Costa Rica. Well, we finally get done, go home. And af after about uh, 24 hours, two days, Rebecca is like, why don't we go to Costa Rica? And I'm like, what? I'm like, why? I'm like, I like it here. She's like, well, just think about it. So Sunday, we go out to the parking lot. I still had this huge 20-foot box trailer. Still had some personal man toys and adult to all of our bikes and motocross. And anyway, we go there, open it up. Rebecca parks her Jeep. It's an old Jeep. Puts a for sale sign on it. I'm telling you, it was within an hour, a guy comes up and says, hey, uh, you selling that Jeep? Yeah. He buys the Jeep. What about this other stuff? Oh, thinking about it. He calls up a friend. That guy comes over, and he says, um, he looks at everything, and he says, uh, Writes down and he says, I want all of it. I'm like, what? Yeah, I want all of it. I'm like, well, dude, I still got personal effects in the trailer. I got a small trailer. I bring it over here. You put what you want to keep in that small trailer. I'm taking everything except for your, your white truck. He wanted everything, the trailer and all. So I'm talking about within just a couple of hours, everything was gone. A couple walks up and says, hey, you selling this stuff? I just bought it all, but I got new furniture in the house I got to sell. Let's go look. Go look at that within just within a week. All, the majority of that stuff was gone, and that was a clear indicator. I was like, well, I guess God wants us to go to Costa Rica. I'll start the ministry there. So within 30 days of Rebecca saying, why don't we go to Costa Rica? Ten suitcases later and one dog. I don't suggest anybody do this, but 30 days later, ten suitcases, one dog. Didn't know a word of Spanish. We arrived in San Vito, Costa Rica, at the border of Panama. Man, what were you thinking? <laughs> what the hell, dude? All of, you know, it's funny because we kind of did the same thing. It's almost it's almost kind of cool not really knowing anything and the whole thing's a freaking adventure. If you know you know what I mean? Like you just kind of everything that happens, you're like, okay, that's the way they do this thing here, and you just kind of go with it. I remember when we were first here, we were just wide-eyed. We just were led around and everything was fine. We didn't really care, but looking back on it. Oh my God, I wouldn't go through that again for, for really nothing. You know what Look, I mean? It's if like I could go back, I would most definitely say, dude, because I didn't even know. I I would have been way more prepared. I would have most definitely gone to one of our relocation retreats because, dude, I was I lost so much money. I just didn't know what to do. I mean, I totally, totally. Um, I would have been so so much more prepared if I had just gone to one of our events. I saw what you did there, Alan. So this is a perfect opportunity to, to uh, share our sponsors. There's another – for people that are thinking about Costa Rica, it's on their radar, but they're not quite sure. we got a relocation retreat coming up. This one's at the end of October, actually. Uh, so if it is on your radar and you want to – but you're not quite sure, come to that. It's a six-, seven-day event, I promise you. Nobody's going to blow smoke. It's a good, bad, the ugly of living in Costa Rica. By I think six or seven days after you meet all these people, listen to everything that we all have to say because we're both presenters there, I think you'll be able to make a pretty decent decision whether it, if Costa Rica is right for you or it's, honey, we're going to Portugal. Uh, we say this all the time. I want to make sure people are very clear. Just the contacts alone that you will meet there are worth the price of admission. Anybody that knows anything about Costa Rica, you do not want to start anything with the wrong people or the wrong contact thousands of dollars later a lots of frustration trust me just the contacts alone but anyway all that relocation retreat information you can go to alan's uh website or mine and sign up for that relocation retreat we would love to see you there it's our favorite thing to do is talk to you around the pool at dinner right. have a beer by, by the ocean it's a beautiful place so i think that's uh yeah that's it absolutely and look you you don't make the mistake that I made uh, because it will cost you. I didn't have any contacts. Uh, the one contact I had, this one realtor that we found, uh, ended up renting us this furnished house for way too much money. So, yeah, don't make the mistake. The contacts alone is well worth it. 
Do you have any regrets about moving here? You know, the um, the only regret that I have is that I wasn't prepared. Uh, me being a, a United States Marine, and, and even before the Marine Corps, I was just, I, I'm able to adapt and overcome. But for Rebecca, she had never, uh, really never traveled. For Las Vegas, first place she had traveled. And so it was definite culture shock for her. And um, so the only regret that I have is that I just wasn't prepared. We weren't ready. Yeah. What do you miss the most from the States? Uh, you know, uh, that's a good question. The thing that I miss the most is that I, the variety, you know, I just came back, was there for, for, for almost two weeks and man, uh, I got my fill of ice cream. You can get some good ice cream down there. You can get good variety. You can get good food, good flavored food. Uh, I miss the safety that I feel when I'm driving on the highway, the really, really friendly people from South Louisiana. That's like, yeah, you know? So I think the only thing I really miss about the Louis Louisiana is that, is that just the variety of how you can buy whatever you want in a second, man. I mean, home Depot is like a candy shop for me, you know? So I, I just miss the ability to get what I want in, in, in a moment's notice. Home Depot is like a candy store for you. Man, it's a candy store. I could go hog wild in there. It's like, I got to have this, and I got to have this, and I got to have that, and I got to – that's a candy store, boy. You know, I forgot a question I wanted to ask you. Back, you said after you had questioned God and his uh, direction, he was pointing you. You had two years of wildness. I want to know what a wild Allen looks like. Well, I don't know if you want to know how <laughs> – I, I asked I, the question. You just got to answer it. I want to know what wild Allen considers wild. <laughs> well, I, I was the equivalent of a male gigolo, I guess you could say. I I, I had no no borders. I just went. Oh, God. Yeah. Peas and carrots, peas and carrots, peas and carrots. I go, I don't want to hear that. I don't want to hear, uh, hear gigolo again in that sentence. <laughs> I, I didn't drink uh, when I was 17 years and I, I started drinking and I started, you know, I just, yeah, I just, I, I kind of went crazy and I just didn't care. All right. Well, I'm glad you got that out of your system because I wouldn't like to see a 60 year old gigolo Allen right now. I, you know, I think that was, <laughs> it pays the bills. No, I'm, I'm lying. <laughs> who, who was the biggest impact on your life? Biggest impact on my life. Wow. Uh, in what way? I don't know. Anyway, actually, I wasn't going to ask you that question because I just thought you were going to say God. Well, actually, that that has been the only impact in my life, and that's simply because um, I, I didn't have a natural father. You know, biological father was MIA. Uh, the the guy I call my father, the deaf guy, he was really working really hard to take care of us. Didn't get to see him a whole lot, but he was really a good guy. But God was my was my father. I you know. Uh, I mean, I remember times uh, sitting on the railroad tracks and and, you know, I thought life was bad as a teenager and, uh, you know, contemplating bad thoughts and God talking to me and telling me that everything is going to be all right. Um, God was definitely I, I don't know why I think maybe I'm just a little bit crazy, but I, I feel like God was the biggest impact. And then, you know, at 19 uh, or when I started going to church and uh, that changed things tremendously for me. But then later on, I started watching, uh, as I started learning more about the online world, I started watching Jim Rohn. And Jim Rohn was a, a motivational speaker that talked about online, but he was a Christian motivational speaker. So he was a very, very big impact on my life. And I used to think I, I want to be, I, I wanted to be like Jim Rohn. I wanted to be able to speak to people, to encourage people, to, to help them and, and let them know that, hey, everything is going to be all right. All right, now we're going to get into some more, let's say, spiritual, deeper questions. I don't know if you want Rebecca to help you with this. I'm not sure, but uh, we're going to go a little deeper on the Alan. So describe Alan in three words. Don't think too hard. Don't think too hard. Okay. Uh, extremely honest, even when people aren't around. Okay. I think that was about 15 words, Alan. We said three words. Are you, do I have to go over the, the, the directions? Jesus. Okay. okay. Honest, loyal, and faithful. Honest, loyal, okay. and faithful. All right. Do you have any worries about the future? Yes. Between now 
and, and I don't want to go too much into that, but between now and the next election, you better be prepared. Matter of fact, we don't know where the world's going to go. And uh, while I did not come here for that, uh, I am being, uh, I will eventually be 100% self reliant because of where I believe the world is going. Going that's why I've been connecting. That's why I've been connecting myself with you because when things go south, dude, I'm coming to find you on your mountain because I know you're going to be prepared because I am not. I don't even know what I'm eating for lunch. And I would, I'll be at your, I'll stay out in your other house or something because I know you're going to have all the cans of Alpo and all the stuff and. Well, I will definitely be well prepared. Uh, and I and I, I think and, and I'm seeing this trend where there's more and more people that are doing that exact thing. But, but oh, I think yes. that's a wise choice. Yes, for real. You know, it's funny. We don't obviously have to get we're not going to get into any politics, but it's 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 interesting that you get that from both across the board. There's really no one uh okay, let's say Democrat Republican will say both. Both of them are worried about the direction of where we're going. <laughs> so, absolutely, you know, so yeah. that whole thing, I, I, I kind of just to chime in real quick. I, you know, I'm, I'm just glad I'm older, man. I really am. I, uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to bring kids up really right now. I don't think, but uh, again, this is about you. So anyway, but I get what you're saying totally on the, uh, anything you're holding on to Alan that you need to let go of. Uh you know, I, I uh, yeah, and this kind of goes back to uh, goes back to spiritual. Uh, you know, every day, every morning, me and God, we, I go for a walk. So if you've been wondering where he's at, every morning we are walking and we're talking, and and that's where I kind of get direction every single day. And uh, I have always been a very very trusting person, very trusting. OK, uh, I mean, I'll give you the shirt off my back. And because of that I've lost my shirt many a times. And so, you know, I've got one scripture that 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 I really hang on to uh, as kind of a uh, foundation for me. And that scripture is. Um, is uh, Proverbs 21, 21, that says. Um, pursue. Righteousness, it says, whoever pursues righteousness and love gets life, prosperity, and honor. And, and righteous is just doing the right thing. I've always done that. But love, and, and it's talking about loving people like God loves people. I have a hard time with that. So when I first came here, because I was gypped so many times, not only by Ticos, uh, mostly Ticos, but even uh, uh, gringos who come here, because I think Costa Rican just draws bad people. Uh, I, I was I was so mad. I I couldn't say anything good. I was so angry. So I've had to learn to let that go, let that go. And so every day is uh, is trying to love people more like God, because I can tell you there's sometimes when I can get so mad, I don't want to love anybody. Boy, I'm like, you, you ain't cheating me again. So, yeah, when you say I got to let go of things, you know, I want to try to do that. I, I, I'm always doing the right thing, but I'm trying to learn how to love people better. If uh, if uh, this was the last day of life, what would you do? I don't think I would do anything. I would be enjoying because every day I enjoy right where I'm at. I'm telling you, you know, we were in the United States for a couple of weeks. And after about three days, I'm ready to come back to my mountain because the, where I'm at, it is so beautiful. So awesome. Uh, I, I, I think it was my last day. Rebecca and I would be sitting in our house drinking coffee, talking about how awesome this place is. Yeah, which leads to my next question and probably the same answer. What are you grateful for? I am most definitely grateful for where I'm at right now. I, I love being right here. Uh, it goes back to the one thing that I, I that I tell a lot of people. If you're going to be in Costa Rica, you will truly enjoy it when you can see why e control your environment. I can control my environment here. I can control how many people are here. And I love it where I'm at because I can control the environment. I don't have uh, neighbors next to me. I don't listen to all the motorcycles, the horns, the 18 wheelers. I can control my environment and I've got the hummingbirds, the monkeys, the wildlife, the mountain views. It's just, that's what I'm grateful for. You know, that's a really good answer, but I just want to give you a little something to th when we ask, I ask the rest of these questions, you might want to work Rebecca in an answer at some point. <laughs> <laughs> well, like I said, Rebecca and I would be sitting. In I didn't house. hear that. I didn't hear Rebecca at all, dude. I thought when I said, what are you grateful for? I, 
You're talking hummingbirds. I thought you were going to say Rebecca. I gave you a, I gave you an in, and you didn't me, take. Well, look, I can let me throw this out there. I don't know that there would be any woman as brave as Rebecca, because look, uh, this woman <clears throat> has come here knowing, and and Rebecca has a passion to be where where I'm at right now as much as I do. No woman would have, and I, I don't. If there is one out there, I've not met her, but I don't believe any woman would have done what she's done. We are living inside this barn right now with a temporary, we do have a shower, we do have a place to use the bathroom, but it's it's pretty much an outhouse of a bathroom, And and but we had no choice. We're so remote, we could not rent a house, live in a house, we had to do what we had to do, but guess what? We are about to move into our house. Uh, and then finish up the inside. I don't know that there's another woman on planet Earth that would have come out here, uh, live in this environment. Uh, we had to put up this screen to try to keep some of the, you know, the mos- hold down the mosquitoes, even though mosquitoes aren't bad. You know, it only takes one mosquito to ruin the experience if you're sitting here watching a movie. So I don't know that there would be another, another woman that would have done that. That's just my opinion. There might be one out there, but I hadn't found her. Not that I'm looking or anything, but I'm saying. I was, was going to say, if you find another one, you might want to just go ahead and let that one go. But, uh, so, so what do you what do you feel the meaning of life is? The, the the grandest of questions. What's the meaning of life? The meaning of life is if you are if if you're not living on the edge, you're taking up too much room. In other words, if you can't be here to help somebody else, you're wasting time. All right, I like that answer because that was a quote uh, you just regurgitated. But what's your favorite quote? My favorite quote. I mean, that, that was good. That's a good one. If you're not living on the edge, you're taking up too much space. I actually wrote that on my bar wall back in Las Vegas. I, I like that quote as well. I, I came across a co- quote, and I don't know who uh, said it, and it used to go out on every one of my emails. And um, – I'm going to have to think uh, what it was because now I can't even remember, but it was. Um, do you remember that quote, Rebecca? It was on, on, on uh, uh, hallucination. Um, I'm going to have to. All right. Think about it. I got, no, think about that. I got another one. So what's your favorite word and your least favorite word? Well, my least favorite word is um, anytime people use the word uh, God with the word Damn, yeah. I just, I, I, I really hate that. I really, really hate that. Uh, well, you hate I, it because I, it's, you hate it because it's blasphemy. <laughs> that's why you right. hate it. I really hate that. That's, that's if, if you were to ask me what word I've never, ever, ever used in my entire life, that's the word I've never used in my entire life. I, for whatever reason, he was a kid. I, that was just, I just had that respect. Uh, and my, my most favorite word, uh, you know, I don't, I've never thought of that. I, I, I don't know what my most favorite word would be, but I, I, I do say awesome. I love awesome, boy. I love when life is awesome, you know. As long as you don't say awesome sauce, we're good. Oh, no. Uh, you ever heard people say that? It's like, oh, my God. I want to go back. I know this is about you, but I just this made me think of something. When I was about 14 years old, I I, I went to Baptist church. You know, I was a church person I, you know, with kids and, or the, the youth groups and all that. I remember thinking I was taught that uh, the only unforgivable sin is blasphemy. And then I was thinking, I'm almost positive I blasphemed. And I, I remember at 14 thinking my life was literally over because I, I knew I go, I must have done that. And I did it. It's unforgivable. I'm screwed. I'm done. I remember. And I always I always as I got older, I got pissed off that I was led to believe that that was a very this sounds stupid now, but I was extremely stressed about that. I was extremely stressed. I was, I believed in God when I was uh, that age. I thought I was literally fucked. Seriously. Like done. And look, why why, I, why am I even doing this? You know, I, I understand completely because, you know, going through so many churches and it was all the religion that just burnt me. I, I remember the very first church I was in. Okay. And, uh, you know, brought my, my deaf wife there. Oh, we got to start a deaf ministry. So here, here, I'm signing for her and I was in the education system and I was interpreting for deaf children. Well, we had this young deaf 
black girl that was there. Okay, she was about um, um, 10, 12 years old. Anyway, I told the pastor that I'm going to be bringing this young black girl to church. We are doing a deaf ministry. And he's like, well, I don't know if you should do that. I'm like, well, why? Well, you know, I don't have a problem with it, but some of the deacons do. If you notice, this is an all white church. And I thought, wait a minute. I, I, did, I didn't know that. I'm like, wait, we start in a deaf ministry, but it, what is, you didn't tell me we start in a deaf ministry for white people. We, you know, so, okay, I'm out of here. Hey, yeah, that's that's craziness. Awesome. Anyway. Yeah. Uh, do you have a, uh, any, like, let's say, favorite moment in life? Like, you look back and go, that was a great moment that this this thing that happened or thought or it sounds like that whole walking in the nature is one of your probably most because that's why you do it but can you think of one that stands out the uh, favorite there, there's like there's time moments, of your life there's there's actually two moments man i almost kind of want to back that up but i didn't set it now there's two moments that altered my life tremendously okay altered my life tremendously and uh, that first moment was when i was walking in the woods and god said that uh, he wanted me to preach the word. Okay. That altered my life. Uh, and, and, and that was really the, the second time because the first time was, you know, I had done gone wild. I was pissed off at God. Uh, and, uh, and I, and, and later I started going back to that little bitty church and I was broke and, and they wanted someone to take the youth to summer camp. Okay. And so, um, I took the kids to summer camp and they, they paid for everything. I mean, they had to actually pay for all my food and stuff. Cause I didn't, I says, man, I'd love to go, but I ain't got no money. Uh, so, but they, we went to Gatlinburg, Tennessee for this youth camp and in Baptist churches, like most Baptists, they don't teach you to really get into the Bible. And I wasn't ever really reading the Bible. Um, and so I was just going to church and I was teaching Sunday school. Anyway, long story short, I go to this youth camp, Gatlinburg, Tennessee, and we're going through all of the tourist shops and stuff. And I kept seeing this same scripture, the same scripture. And it was Jeremiah 29, 11. It says, um, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans for hope in the future. And man, I kept looking at that and I kept thinking about it. I didn't. I wouldn't think much about it. And I, and I kept looking at it and I would go somewhere. I'd see it again and I'd see it again and I'd see it again. And I'm like, wait a minute, God, you, I'm stinking 40 years old. I'm washed up. I'm worthless. I'm broke. I, you know, I know how bad I am, but you still have a plan for me. He says, yeah, I still have a plan for you. That one scripture changed my life entirely. And it was that one moment was where I began to start seeking God. Start, And I actually began reading the Bible right then where I was reading it on a daily basis. And so that was a, the moment that changed my life. And God began really talking to me a whole lot, began reading my Bible. I started running. It was probably about a year later that God then spoke to me in the woods and said, I want you to preach the word. So those two moments really changed my life entirely. I never forget those days. All right, this is the last question. This is your chance to make it up to Rebecca because you need you need some you need to make it up to Rebecca because this was all about you and you never really mentioned her. But anyway, uh what are you doing to invest in your relationship? Well, for Rebecca and I, I met her three years after my divorce, and we both met online. And here's what's um you know, and uh, she was a Christian woman and, and I was looking for a Christian woman and, and she really was very much like me, had come out of a Baptist church and we were both non-denominational. And, uh, you know, the important thing is that life goes up and down, up and down in, in every single marriage. And uh, so my first marriage, I was working a lot and uh, I worked too much. Okay, I enjoyed what I did. And I, I swore that the next wife, I would not work too much. So what I do to invest in our relationship is that, you know what? I don't care how busy I am. If Becca needs some help, I'm helping her. I don't care how pissed off I am at her. I don't care how mad I am at her. Uh, I'm helping her. Uh, every time that we go somewhere, Rebecca, uh, to this day, it doesn't ever have to open a door. I open her door. I treat her like a lady. And and you know what? Uh, she is. She is the most amazing woman around. And so every single day, you know, I get up and I go spend time with God. That's first and foremost. But then we come back 
We have coffee together. We have breakfast together uh, around two o'clock. And we both get into our routine. We're working together all day and uh, we'll go and have a break together where we're sitting on the porch and we're uh, drinking coffee together. Uh, You know, so and then, you know, uh, every weekend we make it a point to uh, have a date, if you want to call it that. Uh, I don't look at it as a date, but it is. We we go out. We try to go to a restaurant and it's an experience. You know, we don't buy each other stuff. We got too much stuff. OK, so what we do is we create experiences. If she wants to sink and go to the beach, we'll jump on that motorbike, go to the beach, sit down there and eat food and have an experience, drink a cerveza or two, get back on that bike and go to the house. You know, uh, so we try to create experiences for each other. And that's how we invest in our relationship. David Allen, that was a hell of a save. I, I want to marry you. I mean, I didn't know that. That was a hell of a save, dude. That was, I, I'm i tearing up. That was unbelievable. You know, I'm feeling, you know, I want to thank you for actually for sharing all this this whole time because my time is next week. And I really do. I, this is going through my mind terribly. I feel like the odd couple couldn't be more perfect. You are like, you know, you're you, and I'm going to go totally dark next week. I'm going to be like the, the devil. I'm the devil over here, and you're like the angel over here. I'm I'm going to have to make some stuff up, man, to compete with this, dude. I didn't know. Well, but thanks, know, for, uh, thanks for sharing, though. I mean, I appreciate the, the share. That's a lot of personal uh, stuff there. Well, you know, uh, when we talked about doing this, it was kind of scary to do this because the reality is that uh, while I respect everyone's choices – there are a lot of people who may unsubscribe. And if they unsubscribe, all I can, all I can say is sorry, but not sorry. I can only be me. You know, oh, no, that'll be next week, dude. You. That's going to be next week. Uh, trust me, we're going to get unsubscribed next week. When I, I You know, it's going to be TMI with me because it's be like, man, Mike, you didn't need to tell us that. We don't need to know. Just talk Costa Rica. Hey, if you want to answer any of these questions, well, there's a yeah, couple let's, of let's, let's quickly there's a couple look at the Here's here's a good question right here that t- uh, Taylor uh, asked. And he says, he says, yo, Alan, what town do you live in and why do you have everything that you need in that area or, uh, uh, you know, or travel to get groceries, etc.? And, you know, we live way up in the mountain in the Parazeladon area, uh, which is about an hour from San Isidro. And so San Isidro which is in, in pretty much the southern middle portion of Costa Rica, has everything that you need, I- including all of the hospitals. Uh, it's the only town other than San Jose where you can go to a Walmart. So, yeah, it has everything we need. And so it's about, uh, you know, a- about an hour away, uh, hour, two hours away, just depending. And we can get everything that we need. And so we live very, very remotely. And the reason I live very remotely goes back to because uh, – I, I like being a remote. I like to where I can control my environment, you know, for 10, you know, for eight years before I came here, been here for two years. But before I came here, I couldn't control my environment. I couldn't control the neighbor and, and with the 15 dogs and the four girls that partied every Friday night and loudspeakers couldn't control my environment. So I couldn't really enjoy Costa Rica the first eight years. But now I can control my environment. C-Y-E. Man, put that down. If you get nothing out of this, CYE, control your environment. You can truly enjoy Costa Rica. So that's a that t-shirt, man. That's a, that's a t-shirt. That's a good one. I like that. That is a t-shirt, man. You so, always can. Uh, you always surprise me, Alan. You continue to surprise me. Well, I hope that's a good thing. Taylor asked another question and said, <laughs> "Am I living off my armed forces pension?" And um, well, you probably already got that answer because I didn't go twenty years, so I don't get a pension. I don't have a pension. I have to work. Okay. And so, uh, but, you know, he asked because he wants to be able to gauge a minimum requirement for life. And we've talked about this before. Why you can live on a thousand dollars. I wouldn't suggest it. You'd be penny pinching all the time. And stuff always happens. But, hey, look, with it, with fifteen hundred, two thousand dollars, uh, you can can live. But, hey, you probably want a little bit more than that. Just all depends on your lifestyle. If you you know, if you want to live like Michael, Michael Allen does and I do, uh, you can live on not a whole lot. So if you if you come here and you want to live your American ways, it's going to cost you a lot more. So, yeah, uh, let's take a look. Uh, hey, you've got lots of great comments here. And like Shelly says, great questions, Michael. You brought a whole new level of understanding. I'm like now I know why that guy ticks. And uh, Christy asked, hey, 
where can we find your courses? And and right now you can't, but I am moving these courses to another platform. Uh, and so, hey, you know, maybe later down the road, I will actually, because uh, I have one course that's over on Udemy. It's all about computers and, uh, you know, uh, and any the other course I took down. But anyway, I, I will be putting up a place where, and then I'll put that out some at some time later to where you can find those courses if that's something you're interested in, okay? Uh And so I'm scrolling through here to see. Uh, and 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 look, there's a there's a question that says, hey, good morning. We're very much interested in information about moving to Monte Verde. Have you been there? Uh, can provide any info. And look, I have been to Monte Verde. Monte Verde is very, very well marketed. But, dude, there's nothing there. I mean, you go to Monte Verde, they got one waterfall, just a bunch of trails and um I'm just shocked at how many people go to Monte Verde and Monte Verde really just, to me, it's just not impressive at all. Okay. And you can find places like Monte Verde all over. And where I live at is and a hundred times better than Monte Verde. But anyway, that just gives you my input on Monte Verde. Okay. Yeah. I'm not a, uh, I mean, if you're a nature lover, um, I guess I, I, to me, it's too squared off. You know, when you're there, if you want to go out anywhere, it's a, it's a big production. It's actually close to La Fortuna where I live, you know, by the bird flies, it's not very far at all. Uh, it's right. the cloud, it's the cloud forest. So it's cool. It's a lot cooler there. Uh, it's known for its nature. It's got a couple nice parks. And if you like that, it's cool. But what I, as you know, kind of living here as long as I have and kind of having a little bit of party boy in me, you know, as long as I have it, it, that town shuts down relatively early. I remember we were sitting there drinking scotch one night on a curb and it wasn't really even that late, like 1130. And the police came by and told us to go to our hotels. <laughs> like, what? So yeah. I'm not I mean, if, if you're a if you're a nature lover, that's where those Amish, you know, they make the cheese over there. The Amish are all over there and stuff. Yeah. Or no Amish or yeah, Amish, I guess. But uh, I'm not yeah. a big fan. I'm not a big fan either, mostly because I think it's a little um, cultish. It's kind of like living in the Osa Peninsula. I love the Osa Peninsula big time, but when you're down there, you're kind of down there, and everything. If you ever want to leave there, it's kind of a production to get you know. Right. Well, that's like places. where I'm at. When I leave, when I leave this place, it's it's you know it's it's an, an all day event because I'm so far up on the mountain now. Hey, R Randall had a great question. He says, man, I, I would, he said he'd love this today. He said, I'd love to sit down with each of you individually. And you know, that's something that you can absolutely do. Don't want to throw this into an advertisement, but look, you go to the relocation event and you have uh, stinking six, seven days where you can sit down with Michael and talk. You can sit down with me and talk. And look, just to uh, throw this out there for the people that actually go to this relocation event and they end up purchasing through the link that's on my YouTube channel. Well, Re Rebecca and I, just as just as our way of saying thank you, you, we, you can schedule a one on one consultation absolutely free with Rebecca and I. And we can sit down and give you a whole game plan all about Costa Rica, all about whether, you know, good, bad and the ugly. Um, or, or maybe you just want to just ask us personal questions. So, hey, I'll for those give people. We I'll give, give you that. The, women, the woman's perspective. Rebecca just chimed in and says, look, you know, if you're a woman, because then you want that woman's perspective, well, you got that one-on-one -on -one consultation with Rebecca and I so that you can get that perspective. Because, hey, Michael can't tell you what it's like to be a woman in, Co in Costa Rica, and neither can I. But anyway, that's just a thought. Okay. I could probably come closer than you uh, to explain it, though, Alan. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> you might can. <laughs> We won't go there, but we might can. Maybe, maybe next Alan, week. Maybe, maybe next week we will. Maybe. Now, Al, now, Randy says, Alan has what I want, but my only question is where. So, you know, Randall, there are tons of places in Costa Rica that you can have exactly what I have, but you can't be scared to get off the beaten path, and you can't be scared to doing a little bit of work. But, see, I love what I do, and there's just tons of places off the beaten path where you can have exactly what I have. And, and it's not hard to find it. You just got to get off the beaten path, start going up the mountains, and you'll be amazed at the roads that go up the mountains. Yes, there's about 137 different species of snakes here, and there's about 17 that are venomous. So if you don't like snakes, you might want to want to live in San Jose. 
Yeah. yeah. If you don't like spiders, I have a spider bite. Yeah. If you're scared of right now. if you're scared of insects, don't go to the jungle. But look, you no, know, if you, are you build you build a house? It's like anywhere else in the, in Costa Rica. You're gonna have insects, but it's great. Hey, Maria has a great question. Sorry for an unpleasant question, but I'm from Canada, and is Costa Rica government spreading fear and and a solution for a new cold season coming? And I'm only gonna touch on this lightly because I know there's a lot of stuff out there, but I can tell you I was shocked. I was shocked my two weeks in in uh, in Louisiana that the news was already pushing and already fear mongering the new COVID strain. You got to wear a mask. You got to you got to. Well, I can tell you that in Costa Rica, we didn't have that problem last time. We're not going to have that problem this time. And I, I, don't, I think it's going to be even less here. So, hey, you know, if you don't want to be controlled by the powers to be in uh, the United States, Canada, uh, other countries, then Co Costa Rica is probably the place that you need to be. So I hope that answers your question. I, I want to answer that question, too, because I don't care. I, I probably have more time on my hands than most people. The new strain of COVID is a cold. So just to be clear, I don't just care if you unsubscribe or not, but it's a freaking cold and all that is crap. So yeah. now, now unsubscribe me. Yeah. There you go. So Shelly, Shelly, thank you so much. Uh, I just had to put Shelly up here. She says, Rebecca is a lovely lady. Thanks for being so vulnerable, Alan. Great interview, Michael. Guys, it's 10 o'clock. I got to go. And I want to thank Alan again for opening up a little bit. And next week, if you're interested, we'll be talking more about me and my uh, life. Uh, if you're interested, we'll be here next week. But even for, forget that, we will be more consistent on our Sundays uh, as we move forward. This was a kind of a weird little thing that we both were gone out of the country and internet problems and all kinds of stuff. So anyway, guys, Michael Allen, TravelCostaRicaNow.com, and I'll a couple Costa Rica. Alan, thank you, and ciao. All right, guys. Look, real quick, if you didn't get your question answered, make sure that you put that question go to my channel, put the question. I'm not over there, you know, reading all of the questions in Michael's over there. So you need to go to my video, my channel, put those questions in there and I'll be sure to answer every single question that you have about anything. Peace. All right, Michael, it's been a good one. We'll see all you right, next man. Time. Thanks, dude.